Good morning. Morning. This is Russ and Kitty with Father's Heart Ministry. And this, you know what this is. This is the morning light daily Bible study. And I just want to say this morning as you join the broadcast, peace be unto you. Amen. Did you know Jesus gave his disciples something called my peace? Mm -hmm. And he told his disciples to take their peace with them wherever they went and to let their peace. It's like their peace was something that attended them and their peace had a will of its own. And so Jesus said, let your peace come into the houses where you go. It's like your peace is going to want to come into that house, but it's not going to come into that house unless you allow it. So the peace was a dynamic something that attended the disciples because they get, Jesus gave his peace unto them, and Paul identified it. He said, yeah, that peace, he said, that is the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And Paul <clears throat> described it in another place as he had a measure that reached to some men but didn't reach to everybody. He said, I'm not an apostle to everybody, but I am an apostle to you. And as an apostle, he demonstrated how his peace and angels did the same thing. Angels would show up and people would fall on the ground. And the first thing they would do is release their peace by saying, fear not. And Jesus, when the soldiers came to take him away in the Garden of Gethsemane, he stood up and released what was in him and the soldiers fell down. It's a sense of dynamic spiritual resonance that comes off of the believer and it, it causes the believer to function in a higher order of being like an angel because angels have that. They show up and we're going to see something of that in our study today, but I want you to get the sense. It's really not what the study is about, although it touches on it and we're not even going to go there. But I want you to get the sense of something resonating out of you. Now, uh, even science can tell you that you have uh, frequency, light and sound, that comes off of your body. Amen. And whether you're born again or not. But because of who God is on the inside of us, it, it's one of my mentors taught me to confess greater is the pressure on the inside flowing out than the pressure on the outside trying to get in. When God was speaking to me yesterday morning about this peace, uh, he gave me an, an extended version of that confession that I've been doing for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes like this. I said, greater is the positive pressure of the peace of God flowing out of me than the negative pressure of the fallen world trying to press in upon me. Mm -hmm. Because something that is flowing, whenever something unclean touched something that was clean under the law, the clean object became unclean. In other words, something that is clean, if it touches that which is unclean, it doesn't render it clean. It's the other way around. Uncleanness was a contaminating influence unless it was dealing with running water. Running water was the only thing that something unclean could touch and it was not rendered unclean. And so you have in you, that's what Jesus was referring to, when you have in you the positive pressure of something flowing out of you, a river of God coming off of you, and it's not a metaphor for a river, it's a river. It's the positive pressure of the peace of God flowing out of you into all your territory. Amen. And so peace be unto you. Amen. Now go out and let the positive pressure of God's peace flow out of you into every aspect of your environment today. Glory. We're it, was <laughs> it was a sweet time in prayer this Amen. morning. With that. So today, Matthew 17, are you going to be transfigured? And hmm. are you ready to have yours now, or are you going to have it later? It's mm -hmm. like, would you like a piece of pie now? No, I'll save it for later. In Matthew 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to this secret place, and he's transformed, transfigured in their presence. The language and the imagery of the transfiguration points tantalizingly. It's my word, my unity word for today, tantalizingly. 
to something that God, as something of God that is yet to be experienced by men and women on the earth. However, in the experience, Jesus warns the disciples that are with him not to repeat what they've experienced until, until when? Until he's resurrected, implying that then that margin of experience that was exclusive to Jesus before the resurrection is then available to you, to others because when you, you get what you preach for he said you have my permission to preach this after I'm resurrected. Mm -hmm. If you preach it now you're just going to frustrate people because they can't experience it. But if you'll preach this after my resurrection you'll get what you preach for. And uh, is there something of this account? This is what the question that I'm asking is there something of the account that we're going to read of the transfiguration that points to a personal experience yet to be made available to you and I? I so respect Charles Parham, who was the mentor of William Seymour, who was the leader of the Azusa Street Movement in, in the early 1900s. And Charles Parham gathered his students together in his Bible school in Topeka, Kansas, New Year's Eve, 1899, and he said, I want you to fast and pray, and I want you to ask the Lord, do we have everything of his spirit uh, that there's available to us today? Do we have it all yet? And they concluded they didn't have it all yet. And in that conclusion, they spontaneously began to speak with other tongues, and the world hasn't been the same since. And I think we need, and then one of the problems is, is we promptly... Uh, christened ourselves the full gospel movement and the Lord told me as a young man it ain't full till it's full uh, because we don't have it all yet just because we speak in tongues you know the, the cessationist denominations say well when you get born again you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire you got it all and the full gospel charismatic Pentecostal prophetic people tongue talking people say au contraire you got born again when you received Jesus as your savior but now you need this second blessing called the baptism of the Holy Ghost but then when they got that they promptly said and that's it we got it all yet but the spirit of God is saying au contraire there is yet mm -hmm. something of my spirit available to men and women walking around in their mortality upon the earth that they have yet to experience that is available to those that reach out and appropriate it by faith and I'll take mine now. Amen. We've got a whole book on it called Enochian Walks with God. It's available on Amazon. If this, if this fires you up, you need to go get that book mm. and implement that in your life. Baptism of fire. Be sure and post pictures on Facebook when you get transfigured. <laughs> so Matthew chapter 17. Those of you that are new to the broadcast, think. This guy's out of his mind. No. Those of you who've been with us for a while saying, oh, goody, we're going to talk about that again. <laughs> verse 1 through verse 13 of Matthew 17, please. Okay, 13. After, and after day, six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make thee three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and they were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man, save only Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man, until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And the disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall the Son of Man suffer, Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now just a little funny here. Uh, the ultra-conservative Pentecostal 
people, of which I have a strong vein of that in my upbringing, you know, they don't believe in watching television. And I have heard them go to Matthew 17, 9, and say, Jesus said right here, he said, television to no man. <laughs> and we chuckle when we say that, but I have heard that preached with utter conviction wow. and received by those that believe it's wrong to have television. H however, mm. they are allowed to have a modified television without a, without a broadcast tuner inside that they can put in their walk-in closets in their bedrooms and they can open those doors to see the television without a tuner for the purpose of watching DVDs of Pentecostal preachers. <laughs> and uh, ask me how I know about that. Uh, in verse 1, Jesus gathers Peter, James, and John and he takes them to a remote location. John's just not going to be left out. This is the guy who at night when they gathered around their encampments would just lean over and say, I, I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable, but I just want to lay my head on your shoulder, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Jesus, just there's no way he's going to leave uh, John out. And it, he takes them to this remote location and it seems that the timing of the event is incidental to Peter's confession in the previous chapter that Jesus is the Christ. He finally got him off this idea of reincarnation and they realize who he is. And uh, now Jesus then, it's almost like he says, all right then, we've cleared that up. Yes, we've cleared that up. Okay, you three, come with me. And they go up into the mountain as he prepares to make himself known to these three, his inner circle, in a profound and remarkable way. In verse 2, after he cloisters them away from prying eyes, Jesus is transfigured before them. Now, what does this mean? As the three were watching, Jesus' face began to glow with an unusual light, and his clothes were shining as though they were illuminated from within. And that's very interesting because Jesus said at a later time, he said, everything that I've received of my Father give I unto you. And so if he gave it to us, this is one of the things his Father gave him, that tells me it's available to be experienced. I remember I was preaching in Louisiana at the second church that I pastored there in the state of Louisiana. And we were having some remarkable services and people were seeing angels and Things were manifesting, these unusual manifestations that just offend uh, religious mentalities. And in the midst of that, back in the back of this crowd of about two, three hundred people, a woman begins screaming and she stands up, I can't see your face! I can't see your face! You're glowing! <laughs> and, and I was just, you know, like getting ready to take up the offering. And, uh, but it is just something unusual. I remember when as a teenager, when I committed to Christ, uh, as a young man coming to early manhood, uh, there was a group of meetings that were taking place in a hotel venue in Corsicana, Texas. And my unsaved friend, who didn't believe in any of this, happened into one of those meetings and he walked in and there was a pillar of fire in the corner. There were two angels standing uh, at the front of the meeting. And the guy that was preaching looked like he was like Johnny Flame of the Fantastic Four. Mm. And he ran out of there. And he knew I had a background in that. He wanted me to explain that. He says, well, come on. Come come with me. I wasn't about to go there. I was a good old Assembly of God boy, and I couldn't find that in the 16 Tenets of Faith. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as this... It. <laughs> uh, I wish like everything I had gone. No kidding. Uh, as this takes place... On this mountain, there appears besides Jesus two figures that were having a conversation that the disciples apparently could make note of, but they weren't close enough to hear. Or perhaps Elijah and Moses, as they were identified, were not speaking loud enough for their words to be perceived. <clears throat> and of course, if you're with Peter, James, and John, Jesus, Elijah, and Moses, who's going to be the first guy to speak up if it isn't impetuous Peter? 
and uh, he says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elias. There we go. Preacher's always going to be pushing the building program. And as Peter makes this decision, as soon as he says this, it's like God, the Father, moves to derail what man would try to make happen next. It's like, okay, you're either going to have a building program or you're going to have a visitation of the cloud. Make your choice. You can't have both. And the cloud comes down, and this voice comes forth, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this is very reminiscent of what the voice from heaven spoke when Jesus was baptized of John and Jordan. The disciples are just overwhelmed by all of this, and they fall on the ground prostrate and afraid. And it's so interesting. Now look at how Jesus was so captivated and in love with his men. Now I got news for you. If I went up to a mountain and suddenly I began to glow with heavenly light and was wrapped in the glory of God and Moses and Elijah come uh, to talk with me and the cloud of God's presence, the Shekinah glory, envelops me and I noticed the three knuckleheads I brought with me fell on the ground shaking. I would say, oh, would you guys, do you mind? I'll get to you in a minute. I want you to notice what Jesus did. He disengaged from the entire experience. He shut down the whole thing and goes over to his guys and he kneels down and he touches them. The love of Jesus. Wow. (laughs) He loved his guys. These these guys, these impetuous guys. Mm -hmm. And he leans down and he touches them. It's okay. It's okay. Relax. (laughs) Can you imagine? And uh, he says, don't be afraid. And the vision lifts, and then they come down the mountain uh, with Jesus admonishing them, don't tell anybody about this until, I love that. Because why? If they talked about it beforehand, they would be talking about something that was not available. What's the, what's the difference with this resurrection? Everything, he said, everything that I've received of my Father give I unto you. That includes the transfiguration, folks. Amen. What an amazing experience. Questions abound as we read this account, which is fully intended to be made known by the three in the accounts of the Gospels. And Jesus made a point on the mountain before he came down, the way he worded it, Don't tell anybody until. He's making a point to make sure this is going to get in the Gospels and that the the story would reach down to you and I today. Now, the first thing we ask is why would Jesus allow the disciples to experience this? I submit to you, I think this happened many times with Jesus because it was his habit to go get by himself Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. He went off by himself to pray consistently. And so I I honestly believe that this is not something that just came on him. I believe it's something he invoked, just like we pray in tongues. We can invoke something as powerful as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. After that, we can then do it at will. I believe Jesus did the same thing. I believe he invoked this. He opened a portal. He opened a personal portal to the glory, to the presence of the Father. And... uh, And it's interesting is ask why Jesus would allow the disciples to see this. Does this transfiguration have any implications for anyone other than Jesus himself? The Apostle Paul, who heard things that were not lawful to be uttered when he visited heaven, he made these remarks that were very familiar in description to this account. Paul was specifically pointing to an experience that was available to the saints. And he didn't just put it in some ethereal atmosphere after we die and go sit on a fleecy white cloud and play our harps. Mm -hmm. Listen to what he said in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. I want to read it. Now behold, I show you a mystery. We're not all going to sleep. In other words, don't think you got to die to get what I'm fixing to talk about. But we shall all be changed. You can be changed. What you think is going to happen after you die, he said, you can get it now. You can experience it now. You will be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound. You have to understand about the trumpet. The Jewish idea of the trumpet, they believed that the shofar, when they would take a shofar, it had to have a rabbinically 
approved curvature in order to make a particular sound because they believe that the sound that a rabbinically approved shofar made with a particular curvature was the exact sound that God made when he breathed into Adam. So when we think of the trump, we're talking about something of God breathing into us and man becomes a living something. And so at the last trump, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruption shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, isn't that what Jesus did? See, he was immortal, but he was not eternal in the sense that he went and laid down his life on the cross. Just because you put on immortality doesn't mean you can't go by way of the grave. Paul the Apostle figured that out. He said, I could go or I could stay. I could, uh, I could lay my life down or I could stick around. He said, it's better for you that I stay. He understood that God put his life in his hands. And so the corruptible shall put on incorruption, the mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God that gives us, didn't say will give us, it's a present tense, gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, you got to understand that as believers, we're walking into what religion has taught us to wait for. Mm -hmm. We're walking into, by faith, what religion has taught us to hope for in some distant future. And you say, well, there's just no precedent for that. Remember Enoch. Remember Elijah. Enoch, it's interesting that Enoch was translated just 33 years, interesting 33 years, after the first known natural death. Only one man had died a natural death. There had been some murders, but only one man had died a natural death at the time that Enoch was translated, and that was Adam. Adam died, and 33 years later, Enoch was translated. It's like Enoch looked at that, and he said, that's not for me, I'll take mine now. Mm -hmm. He reached forward by faith and laid hold upon mm -hmm. something by personal experience that theologians tell us will not be dispensationally available to us till a future time. And he said, I'll have mine now. So we're walking into what religious mentalities tell us we must be waiting for. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing happening to Jesus is a manifestation of God upon his physicality. God is demonstrating himself upon Jesus' physicality, upon his actual human body. When we, receive, when we receive Jesus as Savior, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, he came upon your human spirit. He made his home on the inside of you, dwelling in your heart, your human spirit, by faith. Then, when you experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost, your mind, will, and emotions are impacted. Your, you know, your soul is impacted, overwhelmed, and comes under the direct control of the experience by the Holy Spirit speaking through us in heavenly languages. See, the new birth impacts your spirit. Baptism in the Holy Ghost impacts your soul. What Paul describes and what the three disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration is doubtless what it will look like when our body receives and experiences what our spirit got at new birth and what our soul experienced in the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. We call that the baptism of fire. Is that what, what John said? Mm -hmm. I baptize you with water, that's the new birth. There's one coming, going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. That's the baptism in the Holy Ghost. The Pentecostals say, yes, baptize in the Holy Ghost in fire. No, it's two separate experiences. Jesus came, will baptize you in the Holy Ghost, and then he's going to baptize you in fire. What fire? Amen. It's the fire he demonstrated on the Mount of Transfiguration that we're reading about today. Let's have it. <laughs> and Peter gets this. Peter gets this. Because he says, let's build booths. Let's build outdoor tabernacles in language evocative of celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you study the tabernacles and the three feasts of Israel, you will see that in Passover, Jesus is our Savior. In Pentecost, he is our spirit baptism. And in tabernacles, he lays claim by his glory upon our mortal coil, our physical bodies, 
to call that body felt salvation, the rapture of the saints, the redemption of the purchased possession. It's not something dispensationally imparted. It's something made available by faith because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And we know that what others were waiting for by dispensation, the Hebrews plainly tells us by faith, Enoch was translated. That means we can have it now by faith, what others are waiting to happen someday, one day. Amen. Let's have it now. So Jesus demonstrates this experience. Paul declares the same on this side of eternity, saying that Paul says that there will be those that experience the fulfillment of tabernacles on this side of a death experience. And this goes to show you that while you may be born again and you may have experienced baptism in the Holy Ghost, there's yet something to be revealed that will impact your physicality, something of God's Spirit and His baptism upon your very bodies. When your body gets what your soul got and you spoke in tongues, it's going to look like and it feel like what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. We do not yet on the earth have all that's available to the believer on this side of eternity. Mm -hmm. Enoch demonstrated this. Elijah demonstrated this. And there will come a day that in our immortality, walking around on the earth, we will put on his glory like this shining effulgence that apparently can come and then lift because Jesus goes down and said, hey, boys, don't tell anybody about this because he didn't look any different. Mm -hmm. When he came down from the mountain, the guy's like, it looks, it's, yeah, that's Jesus and we're having a problem casting this devil out. Can you give us a hand? Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to get mine now. I How about you? Now. Do you have the guts? Do you have the integrity? Do you have the humility to accept that there's something in God if it wasn't for Charles Parham being willing to say, we don't have it all yet, we would not have the modern Pentecostal charismatic mm -hmm. outpouring that we've had for the last uh, hundred years. Somebody has to ask. Amen. You've got to have the humility to say, we don't have it all yet. And denominations and belief systems and religious mentalities are loath to claim they don't have it all yet. It's like God told me when I was in my 20s, just beginning to pastor, full gospel. God whispered to me, said, it ain't full till it's full. And I began to study and unearth these things and say, well, that's right. We don't have that, but that's not till after we die. Well, how convenient for us <laughs> that we have to die that makes us totally not responsible for it. But Enoch got it by faith. By faith, Enoch was translated. Hello. So we can walk into what others have been waiting on. Something that impacts on your health, mm -hmm. on your physical body. What will you look like the day after? Just like you do right now. Just like Jesus came down from the mountain and nobody could see any difference in him. But the thing that was poured out on the day of Pentecost as a sovereign move of God was then available through preaching and impartation of faith. Because they went out and laid hands on. Do you understand if Jesus had laid hands on these guys and imparted, they would have been transfigured too? But he said, don't preach this, because they went out from the day of Pentecost, they preached Pentecost, and they distributed Pentecost. Mm -hmm. when, what you preach, you can distribute. Right. And so he says, after I'm raised from the dead, you can preach this. Why? Because after you preach it, you can distribute it. Verse 14 yeah. through the end of the chapter. Very good. It always gets it like doesn't matter. The, the fire in my belly always heats up. Every it doesn't time matter if anybody is experiencing this because we're not preaching experience. We're preaching the word of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him, bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, 
The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that had they that had tri- received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? Change the subject. Uh, he hath he said, Yes, and when he is was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter said unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free. Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. That that take and give unto them for me and for thee. <laughs> now, how many of us can feel an affinity for this man that comes to Jesus and say, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic. I mean, everybody's got an idiot brother. Everybody has an uncle or an aunt uh, or somebody that just needs a touch from, from heaven. You know, we're thinking, you know, they need medication need a beta blocker they need something and so jesus comes and he finds his disciples unable to bring relief to this child vexed with demonic activity now if we have a child suffering in this way in our churches see what's happening is the disciples couldn't get him delivered and it's like when you call customer service and the customer service representative can't help you And the customer service representative says, okay, now I'm going to escalate this to the next department. So the disciples couldn't cast the devil out, so they're escalating this demonic issue, this problem, to Jesus. Now, what do we do? Where do we escalate whenever we can't get somebody free? If somebody comes to the altar, if somebody's being prayed for, and we can't escalate them, where do we escalate the problem to? Do we appeal to Jesus? Or do we say, what? Do we conclude maybe it isn't a demonic problem? Maybe they just need to be treated by doctors who will induce a chemical stupor upon them with drugs for conditions such as ADHD, etc. Well, how convenient for us that medical science is so prepared to offer easy answers for what Jesus called a result of... The problem was not the fact that he had a chemical imbalance. The problem was not in the child. The problem was, was in... The disciples, because Jesus looked at the disciples and he saw faithlessness and perversion. That was the problem. See, we don't want to say the problem's in us, so we're just going to medicate the child. But Jesus, as he's looking, he sees the devil perfectly cast outable. Is that a word? (laughs) He looks at his disciples. Ah, there's the problem. He looks at them, he sees faithlessness and perversion. So who's got the problem and who needs deliverance? And so how convenient that medical science is so prepared to offer easy answers for what Jesus called a result of faithlessness and perversion. Then we see in, from verse 18 that what doctors would treat and what religious practitioners would fail to cure, Jesus simply rebukes as a devil indwelling the subject and they're completely delivered just like that. And notice, now I want you to get something. The disciples are perplexed. What are they perplexed about? They're perplexed about something you and I would never be perplexed about. They're perplexed in asking Jesus, why could we not cast out the demon? That's very interesting. Because in full gospel circles, even where we believe in deliverance and healing, nobody is perplexed when they can't get results in prayer, see the suffering relieved, or see somebody come out of a wheelchair. Nobody's perplexed about that. That's the norm. Criticize the disciples as you must, but see the quality of their expectation, even though Jesus considers their faith small. It is a faith that in their failure to deliver this person, their faith still towers over the most audacious believer today, because for them, they expect miracles to be the norm and not the exception. They were perplexed, not that they could cast the demon out, but that they couldn't. Can we hear a little fan blowing because my computer is deciding? It's, it's getting hot in here. My computer is under conviction, folks. Somebody pray. <laughs> it's warming up in here. 
Uh, <laughs> see, when people go to the altar for healing or deliverance, we are perfectly unfazed. We're not shocked if they walk away still sick, still tormented, still suffering. In fact, we actually have a whole set of doctrines that wrapped around that being the, the outcome. We're not, can you imagine somebody, somebody wheeled in a wheelchair down to the altar and we're shocked that they don't get up and walk away? See, we have all of these doctrines to justify why we have no power, no faith, and no deliverance. We say, it's God's will. We say, God isn't moving and healing just now. We suggest all manner of deep, meaningful theology when in fact the truth is that it is a church culture in which from Jesus' perspective of the comments he makes here, in which healing and deliverance is not the norm, is from Jesus' own descriptives here, he considered it a disgusting perversion not to be tolerated in the least, yet how comfortable the church has taught us to be with our powerlessness. We need to be of a mind that's like Jesus. In other words, it nauseated him. That if somebody comes down and we are part of a, of a, a spiritual community in which the, the tormented can come and go away undelivered, that it makes us want to vomit. Jesus goes on to verse 20 and he starts making blanket faith statements that if Jesus had not said this and somebody said it today, the most erudite scholars among us would say that's blasphemy because he makes these blanket faith statements that if we had the smallest granule of faith, we could literally move a mountain. We say metaphorical, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for a mountain. It's like the Lord corrected me, you know, about out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And I always thought it was like a metaphor. And one day the Holy Ghost says, it's not a metaphor for a river, it is a river. You think about it, I've lived around the Mississippi River my whole life. The Corps of Engineers has been trying to contain the Mississippi River, the mighty Mississippi, for longer than I've been alive. And the more they try to contain it, the more it breaks out. That you've got something coming out of you that is not a metaphor for a river, it is a river. And you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed, and guess what? Nothing shall be impossible. And when we do that, all of the religious mentalities start folding in all these caveats. Unless, uh, God always says yes, but sometimes he says no. Unless, it's not God's perfect will. Unless, maybe God wants you to be powerless, sick, and cancer-ridden for his glory. Unless, and we have all of these justifications for what Jesus called a perverse condition of godlessness and lack of power. Nothing shall be impossible, they say, unless God says no. Nothing shall be impossible unless God declines to answer so you can glorify him in your suffering. It's nauseating. You understand why we're the generation of Laodicea that Jesus says, you make me want to spew you out of my mouth. We must accept on face value and make up our minds to accept, listen, the naked faith statement that Jesus is making here and embrace that faith statement as our norm. This is my norm. I will speak to the mountain and it shall be removed. This is my norm. I will lay hands on the quadriplegic and they will walk. This is my norm. I will speak to the dead and they shall raise. This is my norm. If there's a demon inside of me, he will manifest and be cast out just like that. That's my norm. And I'm going to be shocked if that's not the case. Amen. Not finding justification for our powerlessness, but leaning with our whole person into the rarefied expectation of miracles, deliverance, and healing every time we pray, every time we look up to heaven, exercising the faith which Jesus assures us will move any obstacle in our path. It's so amazing because the daily prophetic word, without any planning for it to be so, the daily word today is, have faith in your faith. Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't... I've heard preachers get up and preach that against faith. Oh, you're just saying, have faith in your faith. Well, God gave me my faith. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me I can't have faith in it? Mm -hmm. So having revealed himself in the transfiguration, Jesus again, he starts talking about his crucifixion. Remember? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm so glad. I'm sick and tired of talking to you guys about reincarnation. Chapter 16. 
And they figured out who he was, and then he immediately starts talking to them about, he says, first of all, don't tell anybody. Second of all, let me tell you what's going to, about to happen that will make you think this isn't true. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be betrayed. So now he's manifested in transfiguration, and immediately he tells them, same pattern. Don't talk about it, and then he starts telling them the exact opposite things that are about to happen. Just like Joseph had the dream, opened his mouth, and the exact opposite happens. How do you know you've heard uh, with validity from God? The exact opposite tends to happen. And so even though the, he told the three on the mount that he'd be resurrected, that's not remembered because notice what it said, they were exceedingly heavy hearted. Well, hold on just a minute. Did, did Jesus not say he was going to be crucified and raised again? When he was coming down out of the mountain, we told him, don't tell anybody till after he was raised from the dead. Why wasn't Peter, uh, impetuous Peter, saying, uh, when the soldiers showed up at, the, at uh, Gethsemane, and how come Peter didn't stand up and start rubbing his hands? I can't wait to see this. Can I come? Can I come, Jesus? Can I watch? I just can't wait to see what you're about to do when you come out of the grave. See, but they weren't listening. We often don't listen. So then they take leave of this multitude and Jesus returns to Capernaum, which is his adult hometown, where Peter all of a sudden is concerned about paying taxes that are now due. And Jesus takes occasion to speak to Peter about his citizenship in the kingdom and tells him, cast a hook into the sea, and he does, and he gets a fish, and there's a coin in the fish's mouth. See, everybody wants a financial blessing. Nobody wants to cast a hook into the sea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to understand, he has a Holy Ghost aquarium all around you full of fish with gold coins in their mouth. And we're sitting back and we, you know, we haven't even reached for our tackle box and saying, oh God, I can't pay these bills out, but Jesus is, hey, hey, look at me, listen to me, listen to the words coming out of my mouth, go cast a hook into the sea. Are you listening? You need to be, You need to know that there's a fish with a gold coin in his mouth just waiting to spit it out into the palm of your hand whenever you induce the corresponding action that was required by Jesus of Peter that caused not only... And you get it when it comes from God. It not only takes care of your need, but it takes care of Jesus' need. You see the principle? Is today Friday? Can I take up an offering? <laughs> I'm just saying, you see, when something comes to you from God, it's not just for you. There's seed for sowing, bread for eating. The bread for eating was the part of that coin that paid Peter's taxes. The seed for sowing was the part he says, oh, by the way, Jesus said, pay my taxes. I think my taxes are due also. Wow, how powerful. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the baptism of fire. Yes, Lord, we're waiting for the redemption of the purchased possession. Yes, we're here to receive the adjudication of the saints. We're ready to have the body felt salvation and we'll take ours now. We're saying to you now, it's okay with us if we don't have to cross the threshold of death in order to walk into our immortality now. That we're here to receive now what you made available, what you manifested, what you demonstrated on the runway of Holy Ghost fashion on the Mount of Transfiguration. You modeled something for us and we're ready for the cloud. We're ready for the glory. We want it to be upon us, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And yes, it's okay if Elijah and Moses want to come down and ratify and sign our baptism certificate because, oh God, we'll take ours now, Father, in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Send pictures.